Good morning. Will you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Malachi, chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I'd certainly like to wish all of the, the dads, the granddads, the great-granddads, and the great-great-granddads a, a very happy Father's Day to each and every one of you. The young family was sitting around the supper table, and, and the little boy looks up to his dad and says, Dad, are bugs good to eat? The, the dad replied, Son, let's not talk about such things at the dinner table. That's really not appropriate. So a little while had passed by, supper was over, and the, the dad goes into the son's room and says, Son, so what is it that you wanted to know earlier? And the little boy said, Oh, nothing, Dad. There was a bug in your gumbo, but now it's gone. Don't worry about anything. And the night before Father's Day... The family went out to eat at a very nice, fancy restaurant, and the dad opened up the menu and saw how expensive all of the items were there, and, and he said, I'm very glad there's a kid's menu. At least that's not going to cost us that much uh, with the kids. And so the next morning at church, as the trays were being passed around for the contribution, the dad's, the, his little girl looked up and said, don't worry, dad, don't pay for me. Kids five and under are free. And so the dad was excited about that. And the young boy who had actually grown up and he was 16 years old and he had, was, he was ready to get his driver's license. And so he asked his dad and he said, dad, can we discuss the, the issue of me using the car? So his dad sat the son down for a little bit and said, All right, son, well, if you get your grades up, if you study the Bible a little bit more, and if you get your hair cut, then we will talk again. And so the boy said, All right. The son said, All right, Sounds good. And so a few weeks had passed. And, and so the, the son comes up to the dad again and says, All right, dad, let's talk about that driver's license and, and me being able to use the car. And the dad said, Son, I've been real proud of you. You've studied your Bible very diligently. Your grades, you're on the honor roll. And, but there's only one problem, you haven't gotten your hair cut yet. The son waited a moment and replied, You know, Dad, I've been thinking quite a bit about that. Moses had long hair. Noah had long hair. Samson had long hair. And even Jesus had long hair. And the father, without missing a beat, said, Yes, son, you're exactly right. And they also walked everywhere that they went. I know all of us dads want to be involved in the lives of our children. And all of us want to do as much as we can. I try to be as active in my kid's life as possible. Uh, Brianna currently is in tumbling, and, and I'm certainly not a tumble coach, but I certainly try to, to attend and, and to watch her do those tumbles and, and to, to see the joy that she has. For the last two years, I've had the opportunity to coach Braden's t-ball team. And, and so with this past spring coming to an end, t-ball, ball is over for us and he's moving up to to coach pitch so we're all excited about that he's got a new glove and he's we're put those old soft tee balls away and now we've got the hard baseballs and and we're getting ready and so the other day after the had finished raining we went out and I started throwing some balls to him to to uh, to hit and we practiced a little bit and he looked at me after a few minutes and he said dad are you going to coach my coach pitch team and I said well yeah I'm planning on it. And he said, well, if you're going to coach, you're going to have to be a better pitcher because you've got some work to do. And there's a true story uh, Dr. Tony Evans tells of a former Major League Baseball star. One day as the boy, he and some of his friends and father were out in the yard playing ball. They played there quite regularly and the grass had always had a very, uh, it didn't grow very well. So one day the kids and the father were out there playing, having a good time, and, and the boy's mom leaned out the window and said, Can't you guys find somewhere else to play? You're killing the grass. And, and the dad looked over uh, to his wife and said, Honey, we aren't raising grass. We are raising kids. 
That's what being a father is all about. That's what being a mom is all about as parents. Our job is to raise our kids in the nurturing, the admonition of the Lord. Yes, we want our children to obey us, and we want to do all of that we can to raise our children, not to provoke or lead them to anger, but to rain, raise them in the admonition of the Lord. One writer has said, From deep within us, we feel that among all the human relationships we experience in this life, there is something unique about the relationship of fathers and children. There is something about it that runs very deep that touches close to the very center of our lives. When that relationship is good, it positively affects every other relationship in your life. And when that relationship is bad, it hands you a heartload of pain that chips away at the joy you feel about the good parts of your life. Such is the power of the father-child relationship in this world. As we turn our attention as we begin this morning to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi was a prophet of God and he's preaching uh, about a hundred years or so after the Ju God's people, the Israelites, had returned from Jewish captivity. Malachi is encouraging the people to rebuild the temple, to put away the corrupt priesthood, to worship God and to obey the law of Moses. Malachi also had an understanding of how important the family relationships were and how important this particular bond between fathers and their children should be. And so as we are making our way to Malachi 4, I'd like to notice just a, a handful of verses with you in the book of Malachi that, that remind us of this relationship between fathers and children. And also, as we're going to notice, that Malachi is prophesying about an awesome event that's going to occur in the first century. This messenger that is coming to lead and to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. It's a message of hope pertaining to the work of John the Baptist in the first century. But in Malachi chapter 1, verse number 6, the Bible says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? This is the Lord. And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. Chapter 1, verse number 9, But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done in your hands or by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts. Verse number 11, For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name in a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Chapter 2, verse number 5. The Bible says, My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. And injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. Chapter 3, verse number 1, of it, pertaining to the work of soon to be John the Baptist. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. 
Finally, in Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, the Bible says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded you, or I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. With the statutes and judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the earth with a curse this morning our lesson is titled turning the hearts of the fathers Malachi was a prophet of God, and he understood all kinds of things that were important and eternally significant in the lives of people. But in the very last verse of the book of Malachi, in the very last verse of the Old Testament, the very last inspired word of God for over 400 years until the New Testament was written, talks about that there will be a day in which the hearts of the fathers will be turned back to their children. And that is the big idea of our lesson this morning. As fathers, we want our hearts to be softened. We want our hearts not to be disconnected and, and moved and broken away from our families. But we want hearts that are connected. We want hearts that are in tuned and turned towards our children and our wife. As we move now over into the New Testament, in the book of Luke chapter 1, we'll actually look at, at several verses in the, in, in the book of Luke and also in the Gospel of John. As we're going to focus this morning on this idea of turning the hearts of fathers back to their children. And since this was a prophecy originally given in the time during the days of Malachi, in reference to the work of John the Baptist, I thought it may be a good idea this morning to, to look at a, a few items that John the Baptist was preaching and teaching and try to make direct connection to the role of fathers and in our attempt and in our goal for our hearts to be turned back to our children. You see there in Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, how this is a, a the coming of John the Baptist, the messenger, was it was the direct fulfillment of the prophecy and Malachi, including verse 16, how he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And verse number 17, John the Baptist being this type of Elijah, and looking to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, of course, the big idea is John the Baptist is leading the way. He's preparing the way of the Lord. And yes, we want to always focus on the work of our Heavenly Father and understand that we have everlasting life through the Father, through Jesus the Son. But these things, as John the Baptist is preaching and teaching, as a fulfillment of prophecy, as John the Baptist is doing his work, the implications are that people are going to turn to the Lord and now fathers are going to be reconnected to their children. So what are some specific ways or things that fathers can do to turn their hearts back to their children? I'd like to make five quick observations this morning. The first two from the Gospel of Luke chapter 3 and the last three from John, the Gospel of John. Each of these beginning with the letter R, uh, having a verb and then S form of uh, the connected with it. Number one, how can we as dads turn our hearts back to our children? Number one, we need to repent of sins. Look over in Luke chapter 3, if you will, verses 3 through 8. We won't read all of these verses, but we know 
that John the Baptist was preparing the way of the Lord. And we know that his message as he was preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, as he is the one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. And in verse number 7, he says, You brood of vipers, who warned you to free, flee from the wrath to come? In verse 8, Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. John the Baptist's message was, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. If we want to be connected to our children, that we as dads need to take an honest look at the sin in our lives. Because as we have sin that is growing and brewing in our lives, that is getting us farther and farther away from our God. God, our Heavenly Father, and those sins are keeping us farther and farther away from being truly connected to our children. We don't want any unrighteousness in our lives. We, we don't want to have any sin in our lives that causes us to, to not always be completely transparent. We don't want any sin in our lives that is causing us to, to kind of live a double life. We don't want any sin in our life that it will keep us from truly being connected physically, emotionally, and relationally with our wife and our children and spiritually with our God, our Father in heaven. So I challenge, well, John the Baptist challenges all of us this morning to repent of sins. Secondly, as we look at the next few verses, uh, Luke, beginning in Luke chapter 3, verse 10, not only do we want to repent of sins, but we want to remain selfless as well. Not selfish, of course, but selfless. Our, as dads, we don't want the world to just consume around what we want. Yes, as, we, as was prayed earlier, we are, as God's designed, leaders in the home. We are to be the spiritual leaders, the head of the house, and we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church, and we are to love our family, our children as well. But the world does not revolve around what we want all of the time. But we have to put the interests of our spouse and children before our own. Notice what John the Baptist says in Luke chapter 3, verse 10 and following. So the people asked him, saying, well, what shall we do then? And he gives a couple of examples about being selfless. He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to them, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your own wages. We want to be selfless. We want to remain that way. We want to have our focus on the well-being of others. John the Baptist is talking about specific things pertaining to sharing food, to sharing uh, financial resources, and also being content with what we have and not mistreating or cheating on others as far as how we interact with them. We want to remain selfless. We want to put the interests of others before our own. And as dads, we want to be providers for our families and make sure that our wife and children have all the things that they need in order to experience life in such a way that will keep them connected to God and connected together as a family. 
Going over now to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. You know the story of John the Baptist is covered in the first couple of chapters of each of the four Gospels. And there are parallel accounts of each of these items that we're mentioning. But if you would, go over now to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. As dads striving to remain connected to our children, we want to make sure that we repent of sins, remain selfless, Hey, number three, we need to remember our status. We need to remember our status. Over in John chapter 1, verse number 19, the Bible says, Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. You see that? John the Baptist knew who he was. He knew who, what his role was. And he understood that his status was not the one of being Christ himself, but he was the messenger. He was the one preparing the way of the Lord. John the Baptist understood his role of who he was and what he was called to do. And I love, in relation to this, what the Bible says what, in John the Baptist reflecting over in, in John chapter 3, verse number 30. In reference to Christ, John the Baptist says, He must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist understood his role, his status. Now, as head of the house, as dads, as people that are trying to make it in the world, that sometimes we kind of get confused or distracted. Sometimes, as providers of the house and, and trying to do the best that we can, we, we go after all of these things of the world that might get us more money or more power or, or more opportunities and more and more stuff and more and more acc accolades and more and more recognition. Now, all of us should always strive to do the best that we can wherever we're at. But we need to understand that our status is dependent upon our relationship to God the Father. And our status as husbands and dads it should be number one. That there is nothing more important, nothing fancier, nothing more prestigious in this world except to know that we are connected with our wife and with our children. Coming back to John chapter 1, how is it that we can, as dads, turn our hearts back to our children? We want to repent of sins. We want to remain selfless. We want to remember our status. And number four, we need to recognize the Son of God in our lives. John chapter one, verse number John chapter one, verses twenty, verse twenty-nine. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And verse number 34, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And verse number 36, looking at Jesus as he walked, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. As Christian husbands, as Christian dads, we need to be just that, and that is of Christ. We need to recognize the awesome opportunity that we have to keep Jesus number one in our lives. To recognize that Jesus is the one and only true Son of God. To recognize that Jesus Christ loves us to the point that He has died for us on the cross. Yes, the old saying, it's cliche, but it's very true. Real men love Jesus, and they recognize what the Son of God can do in making a difference in their lives, not only in their careers, but more importantly, in their families, in their homes as well. 
And fifth and finally this morning, as we turn our focus to John chapter 3 and, and verse number 25, we want to be able to repent of sins, to remain selfless, to remember our status, to recognize the Son of God. And fifth and finally, as fathers, and I'm sure by now you figured out these principles apply to, to everyone in all relationships. Number five, we need to be able to resolve situations as well. John chapter 3, verse 25. There arose a dispute among some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, who he who has with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptized, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Unfortunately, we do not live in a world of perfection all of the time. Unfortunately, we don't live in a world in which there's never any problems. But as men of God trying to be connected to our children, we need to understand that situations will arise. Conflict will occur in family life. There will be problems that need to be solved and problems that need to be addressed. And as men of the house, we don't have to sweep them under the rug and pretend that they don't exist. As men of the house, we don't have to just say, all right, well, you deal with it and, and not have any direct interaction with it. As men of the house, we don't want to put the, all the blame of all the problems on our spouse or to blame all of the problems on our children. But as men, we will need to man up and to know that there are situations that arise in family life that are troublesome, that are painful, that are difficult. But we do our very best to be facilitators of change in that we resolve conflict. We don't stir the pot. We don't make things worse. We don't lose our temper and blow things out of proportion. But instead of exasperating problems, we try to solve problems. Instead of making the situation a whole lot worse by how we lose our cool, we make the situation a whole lot better by keeping our self-control and looking for ways not to blame anyone, but to take ownership and to understand that I, as the leader, the spiritual leader in the home, have the opportunity to make this situation better and to lead by example with the love of Christ in my heart to make everyone understand that it is going to be okay. We are going to get through this. And together, as one family serving one God, we can resolve any situation that comes our way. As we begin to conclude this morning, I'm reminded of a song sung by a group, Sanctus Real, and it's a song called Lead Me. It's a story about a husband and dad who is trying to do better. He's a man whose heart has turned away from his wife and children, but he's also a man who is desperately trying to fix that and to be reconnected with his family. The fellow says, I look around and see my wonderful life, almost perfect from the outside. In picture frames, I see my beautiful wife, always smiling. But on the inside, I can hear her saying, lead me with strong hands. Stand up when I can't. Don't leave me hungry for love. Chasing dreams, what about us? 
Show me you're willing to fight, that I'm still the love of your life. I know we can call this our home, but I still feel alone. I see their faces, look in their innocent eyes. They're just children from the outside. I'm working hard. I tell myself they'll be fine. They're independent. But on the inside, I can hear them saying, Lead me with strong hands. Stand up when I can't. I know we call this our home, but I still feel alone. So, Father... Give me the strength to be everything I'm called to be. Oh, Father, show me the way to lead them. Won't you lead me? To lead them with strong hands. To stand up when they can't. Don't want to leave them hungry for love. Chasing things that I could give up. I'll show them that I'm willing to fight and give them the best of my life so that we can call this our home. Lead me because I can't do this alone. We finish in John chapter 3, verses 35 and 36. And it's an understanding that as Christian dads and husbands trying to turn back to our children, we understand we cannot do this alone. We need our Heavenly Father. The Bible says in John 3, verse 35 and 36, The Father, the Heavenly Father, loves the Son. And has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Turning the hearts of the fathers... As we repent of sin, as we remain selfless, as we remember our status, as we recognize the Son of God, and as we resolve situations, we can and we will lead our families home. We will prepare the way, not in the wilderness, but in the way of the world, in this world, preparing and leading our families home. Not our home where our physical address is, but leading our families home to heaven. And as we are turning the hearts of our children back to us as fathers, and as fathers as we are turning our hearts back to our children, we ultimately and inevitably at the same time simultaneously will be turning our hearts back to the Heavenly Father. And our Heavenly Father is turning His heart back to us, giving us an eternal home in heaven, everlasting life that only He as Heavenly Father can provide through the wonderful work of the Son of God on the cross. This morning we are singing this song of encouragement. We want you to be a Christian. We want you to believe and repent, to confess your faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and to be buried with Him in baptism, to have all of your sins washed away. If we can help you in any way this morning, will you come forward while together we stand and sing?